Good evening. Um, tonight will be briefed by NTSB Chair Jennifer Homendy, and Homendy is spelled H-O-M-E-N-D-Y. Chair Homendy. Good evening. Come on over just a little bit. Okay, thank you. We have a whole team here today. <clears throat> All right. I'm Jennifer Homendy, and I'm chair of the National Transportation Safety Board. And with me tonight is John Lovell, our investigator in charge. We also have Clint Crookshanks and Leone Benitez Cardona, both of which are aerospace engineers for the NTSB and really specialists in structures, including uh, looking at the airframe, uh, the door plug, and uh, the surrounding structure around the door plug. Now, uh, one of the NTSB's core values is transparency. We believe when we have factual information that has been verified, that it's our duty to provide it to the public and uh, to the media. And so tonight we have a lot of information that, they want, that we want to share. <clears throat> First, I'm going to uh, provide a, a summary of the event from the flight data recorder. We're going to talk about what our survival factors group did today. And then I'm going to talk about what our systems group did today. And then <clears throat> we'll have some discussions uh, from about structures and what the structures group did. So uh, for the summary of the flight data recorder, for, or from the flight data recorder, I'm going to read it. At 17.06 and 47 seconds Pacific Standard Time, the aircraft departed runway 28 left at Portland International Airport. At 17.12 and 33 seconds, the recorded cabin pressure dropped from 14.09 to 11.64 pounds per square inch when the aircraft was at approximately 14,830 feet and 271 knots. The cabin altitude greater than 10,000 feet warning activated. At 17.12 and 34 seconds, the master caution activated. The cabin pressure dropped to 9.08 PSI at approximately 14,850 feet and 271 knots. At 17.12 and 52 seconds, the master caution deactivated. At 17.13 and 41 seconds, the aircraft continued to climb and reached a maximum altitude of 16,320 feet and began to descend. The airspeed was 276 knots. At 17.13 and 56 seconds, the selected altitude changed from 23,000 feet to 10,000 feet. At 17.14 and 35 seconds, the master caution activated for three seconds. At 17.16 and 56 seconds, the aircraft began a left turn from 121 degrees. The altitude was approximately 10,120 feet. At 17.17, the aircraft descended below 10,000 feet. At 1718 and five seconds, the aircraft altitude was approximately 9,050 feet and the airspeed was 271 knots. The cabin altitude greater than 10,000 feet warning deactivated. The cabin pressure was 10.48 PSI. At 1726 and 46 seconds, the aircraft landed on runway 28 left at Portland International Airport. 
Now, the survival factors team interviewed uh, the remaining two flight attendants, one from the aft of, aft of the aircraft and one for, from forward. Uh, their interview and discussion was consistent uh, with the interviews of the other two flight attendants. Uh, they also reported pretty significant crew communications challenges during the event. They didn't know what was occurring. Uh, they uh, were certainly concerned, uh, they stated, about the four unac unaccompanied minors, and their focus was on them and the three lap children at the time. Uh, the two flight attendants in the aft outboard seats in the aft galley had difficulty seeing what was going on uh, in the cabin and in the aisle. It's very difficult from that location to see anything. There is a very, very small mirror provided to look down the aisle. It's not sufficient. So it was very difficult for them to see. They, uh, the flight attendants mentioned uh, that the uh, communications was so poor that they felt like they, they really needed guidance and information, uh, and it was, it was a pretty terrifying event. Now, um, with that said, uh, I know that a lot of media is reaching out to the flight attendants. The, the interviews have been very emotional. This was a really significant event with zero information at the time. There's a lot of trauma that they are working through. It's going to be a long process. It was terrifying. I would ask, the NTSB is asking, please give them that time. They are working with peer-to-peer -peer counselors um, and, and they just need that time to heal, and they have asked us to mention that uh, in this media briefing, and I would really ask that you respect their wishes and give them that time to really begin to process uh, what they experienced. Now, the cockpit door. Uh, we found today that the cockpit door is designed to open during rapid decompression. It is designed to open during rapid decompression. However, no one among the flight crew knew that. They were not informed. Uh, so Boeing uh, is going to make some changes to the manual, which then hopefully will translate into uh, procedures and information for the flight attendants and for the uh, uh, crew uh, in the um, cockpit. As far as the oxygen mask, that we weren't sure if it deployed uh, or if it was stuck, uh, it did deploy. Uh, we interviewed the passengers in that uh, row, and uh, they had put uh, the, the oxygen mask back up in the panel, which was the other thing we suspected, um, but it did deploy and was working. Now on to systems. Our systems group uh, focused on the cabin pressure control system on the aircraft. This is the auto pressurization light that illuminated that, I, that we have gotten a lot of questions on. This system is designed as a triple redundant system with one primary cabin pressure controller. It's a computer system. There is a secondary cabin pressure controller a secondary, that's a secondary computer system. And then there's a manual controller. So there are, uh, it's a triple redundant system. That means that if the primary controller fails, the flight crew switches to the secondary controller. If that fails, they can switch to manual. Any one of these systems is fully capable of maintaining safe cabin pressurization. In fact, if either one of the computer systems is inoperative, the FAA allows the operator to continue flying the aircraft. We have verified from the maintenance logs that the redundant system 
operated as designed on December 7th, January 3rd, and January 4th, going into the alt mode, not needing to go into the manual mode. At this time, we have no indications whatsoever that this correlated in any way to the expulsion of the door plug and the rapid decompression. Now, the NTSB is very thorough, so we will uh, go back and look at the flight data recorder, and we will get data on cabin pressure, and we're also going to download the memory on the cabin pressure controllers. We may have to pull the units to see why it was acting up, um, but a Boeing, we have asked Boeing uh, for a specialist uh, to arrive tomorrow to work through, uh, through this so we can uh, just go through the rest of it. But again, no indication of any correlation between the two. With respect to the ETOPS restriction, Alaska Airlines reported to the NTSB that their internal policy is to restrict aircraft with multiple maintenance, maintenance write-ups for certain aircraft systems from flying ETOPS flights for a period of time. That's not required by the regulation. That is an extra step that Alaska Airlines put in place. Now, ETOPS stands for Extended Twin Engine Operations. What that means is that ETOPS allow, uh, permits twin engine air, airplanes to operate over a route that contains a point further than three hours flying time, three hours for this aircraft, from the nearest airport. And the restriction was put in place per Alaska as an extra step to ensure safety and to allow them to conduct maintenance. As for the structures, we, um, I want to start by thanking Bob, who all of the media successfully outed, um, but Bob apparently was a star with all his students today. Um, I, I, I really want to thank uh, the community overall. I, I can't thank you enough. Every time the NTSB asks for help, every single time the community pulls through, and I, I just want to say thank you to everyone. I especially want to say thank you to Bob. I'm sure he was a hit at school today, um, so that's very exciting. Uh, we did go out at 7 a.m. this morning to retrieve uh, the door plug. Um, we are still looking for the bottom hinge fitting and a spring. It's a pretty large spring. Uh, the, the fitting is a green circular piece with a hole in it. Uh, it's not key to the investigation. This is not something that's key to us determining any, anything or ruling out anything. We're just fine. But it's always nice to have some of the pieces if you find it. And uh, if anyone does, please call um, uh, NTSB. Please email us at witness at NTSB.gov or contact local law enforcement. Again, I want to thank local law enforcement and the FBI for helping us also look uh, uh, throughout uh, the early stages of our investigation. Uh, I will mention that community members also uh, found today uh, a plastic window frame and a headset and uh, uh, headrest, excuse me, a headrest, and uh, turned that into uh, the NTSB. So we really appreciate that. Uh, thank you. Now our structures team um, examined the right door plug. Uh, so the door plug on the left is what expelled uh, the aircraft. They examined the right door plug in its installed position today and found no discrepancies. Everything was in place. Now again, they examined it in the installed position. At some point, they may look at it in the position where you would conduct maintenance, which is a fi uh, 15 degrees down. That's still to come. Now, tomorrow we also plan to do a 3D scan of the left opening and match it up to models and drawings to ensure that we're not missing anything. 
Uh, we're also going to send components and the door plug back to our lab in DC for further examination. Um, now, what we did want to provide to everyone today in real time is what broke. We are going to provide what broke. We cannot tell you at this time how or why. We do not have that information. We will have that information. It's going to take time, and we're going to have to analyze the components and the door plug in our lab to be able to figure out how this happened and what, uh, why this happened. So I'm going to allow um, Crick, Clint Crookshanks to go through that. Again, uh, Leoni and uh, Clint are the specialists here, and I think it's important that you hear it directly from them uh, so you get the right information. Thank you, Chair. I'd like to give another shout out to Bob. Without him, we wouldn't have this door plug and uh, be able to examine it, so yay, Bob. Um, as you all know, the 737-9 has the provisions for a cabin uh, emergency exit door in the aft fuselage. However, on this particular airplane, there was no door installed in that location due to the passenger seating configuration of the airplane. Instead, there was a plug installed in that op opening. That plug is retained in the opening uh, when 12 stop pads on the door frame interface with 12 stop pins on the plug uh, to prevent the door from blowing out of the fuselage. In order to install that plug into the fuselage, you bring, rotate it up so that the door or the plug stop is above the door stop. It translates inboard and then down so the stops then engage. At that point, four stop bolts uh, are installed in the mechanism to prevent that plug from translating upward, uh, disengaging those stops. There's also uh, a guide roller on each side on the upper side of the plug uh, or on the upper side of the door frame that engages with a guide fitting on the plug uh, to establish the location in the opening. The, the exam to date has shown that the door, in fact, did translate upward. All 12 stops became disengaged, allowing it to blow out of the fuselage. Uh, we found that both guide tracks on the plug were fractured. Uh, we have not yet recovered the four bolts uh, that restrain it from its vertical movement and we have not yet determined if they existed there. That will be determined when we take the plug to our lab in Washington, D.C. Thank you. I know you're all going to have lots of questions on that, and uh, Clint and uh, Leone will be able to answer those. Um, and just to reiterate, uh, we will be able to determine whether the bolts were there. Uh, we can determine it, that based on witness marks, uh, in our lab uh, with much greater capability. We have microscopes and um, other, um, uh, what is the word? Scientific equipment. Scientific equipment. It has been a long day um, to be able to evaluate uh, uh, the, uh, help our team evaluate what they're seeing in the door plug. One thing I'll note is that we have offered party status to Spirit Aerospace and to the Machinists Union. Now, this is going to be our last on-scene media briefing. Please contact Media Relations if you would like uh, additional, if you have additional Media Relations needs. Also, please monitor our website at ntsb.gov. I want to take a, mu a few moments, though, uh, and say thank you. Again, I want to say thank you to the community. What an outpouring of support. Incredible. Thank you. We could not do what we do without you. I also want to thank the media. I am very appreciative of everything you do. I believe you play a significant role in improving safety and holding the NTSB and every other federal, state, and local agency accountable for ensuring the safety of others. 
So thank you for everything you do. Keep it up. I also want to thank our parties. The parties to our investigation help provide the factual information. They are the ones who give us that technical information that allow us to ask all the great questions and dig into the issues. But then we, t we move away from the parties at some point and we do our own analysis without the parties and we develop our own uh, findings, probable cause, and safety recommendations uh, that we hope will get implemented. And we are not shy, I am not shy, about pushing for implementation because without those changes, there really is no safety improvement. So that's why we push so hard. Finally, I am very proud of the NTSB team. We always are. I would like to thank the following team members. Adam Hooray, Andrew Bucklin, Clint Crookshanks, Dewan Civilian, Eric Weiss, James Anderson, Jen Gabris, John Lovell, Leoni Benitez Cardona, Marvin France, Matt Fox, Rolando Garcia, Star Bloom, Stephen Stadius, and Zoe Kelleher. It, we, I don't know that a lot of people realize, but our agency, we handle all modes of transportation. We have only 437 employees. They are incredible, and we are proud of them every single day. We're a small agency, but we have a really big voice, and we use it to save lives and prevent future tragedies. So with that, we're going to take uh, questions one at a time. I also saw Chris over here jotting down everyone's name. Do not call them. <laughs> uh, so one at a time, name and affiliation, even though I know most of you now. But go ahead and Chris, and then we'll come over here. Interesting for you, CBS News. Um, <clears throat> I'm curious as we're hearing reports now of both Alaska and United finding loose bolts. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like you're saying you're not even clear if there were bolts at all in this door. Does the max need to be looked at more closely? Well, uh, first of all, we're really focused on this aircraft. Uh, however, we w are not shy about going broader than just this aircraft. We need to first and foremost figure out what happened here on this aircraft. If we have a bigger system-wide or fleet issue, we will issue an urgent safety recommendation to uh, uh, push for change. With that said, we are aware of the reports of that are coming back from the inspections from United and Alaska and Boeing. Our team is collecting that information, and there will be some follow-up from the inspections. Uh, but it, it, right now, we're focused on this one, but we can go broader at any time. We don't have to finish the investigation uh, to issue an urgent safety recommendation. We can do that any time, and we have done that for entire fleets before. But quick follow-up. If you don't know if there were... You broke my one question rule, but I will allow that. One question to <laughs> if if you don't know if there were bolts, and then both airlines are finding bolts that weren't tightened, if you can't trust the manufacturer to tighten those bolts, can you trust them to tighten all the other bolts in the airplane? Right now, we are focused on the evidence. The evidence tells a story. The components on this door plug tell a story. We have to follow the evidence and see where it takes us before we jump to any sort of conclusions. We cannot speculate. Uh, we, well, we never jump to conclusions, but we don't, and we don't speculate. We deal only with facts, and we're going to have to look at this aircraft. But again, we will go broader if we need to. Can you just explain that 
Yeah, and uh, I'm going to ask Clint uh, to correct me at any point. Uh, there are two hinges on the bottom, uh, those hinges, and there are two um, uh, roller guides. fitting guides, guides, roller guides. Uh, the purpose of the hinges and those guides are uh, to uh, get, um, get the door onto the aircraft and to allow it to uh, move outward for uh, maintenance, that outward for 15 degrees. It is the two uh, guides on the top that broke. Um, those have two bolts in them. We, have, we are, don't know if there were bolts there or if they are just missing and departed when the door plug departed. But it's those two at the top. Uh, the bottom uh, hinges were also missing uh, those uh, bolts, uh, so um, uh, we, we can't make an, uh, we, ha we don't know if they were there or if, it, again, they came out during uh, the uh, violent explosive um, decompression event. Are these rollers a part of the door or on the actual fuselage? On the it's on the door plug. They're on the, uh, nope, I'm going to just turn it over at there, this point. <laughs> Move on. <laughs> So the guide rollers are installed on the fuselage. The guide roller tracks are installed on the plug. Uh, we found the guide roller tracks were fractured. So if you imagine these six uh, 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 stop fittings, there's six on each side, so it's 12 stop fittings. The purpose of those stop fittings are to prevent the door from being ex ex expelled uh, from the aircraft because there's a lot of pressure inside the aircraft. The pressure, um, pressure outside the aircraft is low. It's higher inside the aircraft. So there's a um, force pushing outward. So you need something that holds it in place. These six stop fittings, there's six of them on the door plug and six of them on the frame, the, uh, the door frame. Mm -hmm. They match each other. So if you imagine high-fiving somebody, they're hitting each other, preventing, it, preventing that door from coming outward. In order to put the door in place, you, if you put it just right in place, it would hit those uh, stop fittings. You couldn't get it in place. So what you have to do, uh, it has to go upwards, go on the hinge, and then go in. And when you are doing maintenance or inspection, it also comes up and comes out. So that's what we're talking about. Yes, and then here. Can you tell us how many of the planes on the United planes had those bolts and whether there are any other issues on those planes other than those two? I don't have, inf we don't have information on how many of the, pl the question is on how many of the United planes had loose bolts. We don't have that information. FAA should have that information as this is part of their airworthiness directive. They would gather uh, the overall amounts. And were there other issues besides those bolts that you know of? Uh, are there other issues besides the bolts that we know of? Uh, we have only heard reports of the bolts, uh, but we're not aware of the extent to what they found. The doors yeah, here and there. The doors are with the fractured components, would those have been for certain fractured prior to the disconnection, or could the event have caused those fractures? I'm going to allow you to answer that one. Repeat the question, though. The fractures that you found, were they uh, contributing to this incident or a result of the incident? The question is, uh, were the fr fractures uh, we found contributing to the incident or as a result? Uh, based on our examination so far, uh, the door translated up and disengaged from the stops, which then fractured the fitting. So it was after it disengaged from the stops. So then it doesn't necessarily explain what? Correct. Uh, here and then here. Uh, Deborah Bloom with Reuters. The FAA warned airlines in August against using the engine's de-icing system on Boeing Max planes, specifically in dry air conditions, for more than five minutes. They said that it could cause the composite inlet surrounding the engine to break off and hit a window or door and cause decompression. On Friday, a 
around the 5 p.m. hour when the incident occurred, it wasn't raining, and the passengers we interviewed told us that they were delayed from takeoff by 20 minutes because the plane was being de-iced. What are we to make of this, and was there any damage to the door or the plane itself that would indicate that the de-icing system could have played a role in the decompression? You want to address that? Sure. Um, you have relayed um, a very elaborate um, scenario, which there is no evidence to support at all. The icing is a procedure that is done routinely during the winter periods, and there are no indications that is that is contributory in any way to this event. Yes. Uh, the question was on what came of the interviews of the pilots. Uh, so for the, um, pi uh, the captain and the first officer, uh, they um, described a very loud environment, a chaotic. Uh, at the time, they heard a bang uh, and then some, air pr uh, some pressure changes in their ears. Uh, they mentioned uh, that the door uh, had flown open at the same time. A flight attendant had, try had attempted to close it a few times, uh, eventually succeeded in that. The, um, uh, one of their, their checklists, their laminated checklist, flew out the door uh, when the door also opened. They described it as very loud, windy at the time. Uh, and they had trouble communicating. Uh, they had trouble hearing each other. They had trouble hearing air traffic control. Uh, and they had trouble communicating throughout the event. Uh, I will say, once again, excellent job by uh, the entire flight crew, those in the cockpit and those in the cabin, uh, and also air traffic control. Here and here. Stop fittings. Stop fittings. Those were not locked in, and because of that, the door plug shifted upward? No. So the stop fittings, uh, so the question is on the stop fittings and their role. Uh, so the stop fittings, there's no locking mechanism on them. Again, it's, it's like saying a high five to somebody. They're pressing against each other, or really it's pressing from inside the cabin outward. Um, but it's essentially holding holding the door in place. Um, the upward motion uh, is one that uh, is needed in order to the, get the door in place on installation and to move the door outward uh, when uh, 15 degrees during inspection and maintenance. Did you want to add anything to that? Are you good? Mm, yeah, I think so. So okay. if the door is bolted in, it should not move up. It should not move up. If the door is bolted in, it, it bolted in though uh, is an interesting term. Uh, the uh, roller uh, guides and the bolts on the bottom for the hinges are, are they're not for, um, you know, essentially holding the door in. They are designed uh, for uh, maintenance and for putting, for installing the door. It's the stop fittings that are designed to keep the door in place. So the bolts don't keep the door in place? No. Then what is the significance of it if they're missing? The, the four bolts in the mechanisms prevent the door from translating upwards. So if the bolts are there, the door doesn't move up, which means it doesn't fly off. In, yes, uh, by design, if the bolts are there, it prevents the door from translating upwards and disengaging from the stop fittings. And flying off the plane. And flying off the plane. Okay. However, the bolts can break or uh, any number of things which we have to look at. So when you, when you put the door in, when you install the door, uh, or you're doing maintenance or an inspection, um, you need movement. 
Uh, but when you're not doing that, you need those bolts so there's no movement upwards. Um, if you if you didn't have the if if you didn't allow the door to move upward, you could never get the door out. So the bolts hold the door in its upright and locked position, so to speak. Yes. Such that it doesn't move in a way that could uh, have it exit the aircraft unexpectedly in flight. Are you okay with that? Yes. Okay. It's like you were saying earlier that the stop fittings aren't what prevent it necessarily. Like there, it's like a high five you described. Yes. So, so the bolts prevent it from like on high five. Mm, mm, no. 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 So the. <laughs> So uh, here, hold, put your, put your. We're gonna high five right here. Here's a stop fitting. There's 12 of these, right? Okay, great. This is this is our moment, John. Uh, if if you want to open this door, you can't if this is pushing. So if you if you want to install the door, or if you want to do maintenance and rotate it outward, or uh, push it outward. Uh, you 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 can't do it in this position. You have to come up, and then bypass those stop fittings in the, in order to come down. Understood? Okay. We did have a question. Over, oh, here and then there. Sorry. Go ahead. Kyra Buckley, Oregon Public Broadcasting and PR. Uh, I'm wondering about the door plug that you guys found here in the Portland area, and you're you're ta you're sending it back to Washington D.C. Um, I'm wondering how it's getting sent back to D.C. to kind of preserve so you guys can look at it. And mm -hmm. then also about how long do you expect the in investigation into the, the, the why and how should take? I'm going to ask Clint to address that. So the, the plug will be crated and shipped uh, along with some other parts that we are retrieving from the airplane to our lab in Washington, D.C., uh, and we will set up a time to look at those parts that is uh, convenient for our staff and for the parties to the investigation. Shipped by plane? Don't know. Okay. Probably too large to go by plane, but don't know yet. And any idea how, how long the investigation might take? The, our investigations can take anywhere from a year to 18 months. Now over here. Uh, it, the question is on the bolts and uh, some of the um, uh, reports from United and Alaska uh, and Boeing of loose bolts and um, the extent of that and how you can be a, a assured going forward that that won't uh, uh, expand or happen again. That is something uh, that is a, it's a great question for the Federal Aviation Administration. They are really spearheading efforts to inspect uh, these planes and uh, uh, working with Boeing and the operators on how the inspections will be performed and learning what repairs will be made. So that's something that I would direct folks to the FAA uh, for. Last question? Just to be sure. One quick follow up on this actually on the inspect and clear process. Oh, the, the, the NTSB, do you feel comfortable at this point that you know enough about this accident that you um, feel comfortable that Max 9 can, the Max 9 fleet can fly again? I know that you're just looking at this plane right now, but based on what you know now. Yeah, for the Max, uh, Max 9 fleet, that's a decision for the regulator, for the Federal Aviation Administration. The NTSB, does not ground fleets. That's something that the regulator is responsible for. Uh, what we do is we determine our entire mission is not just what happened, but why it happened uh, to prevent it from reoccurring. And we, through the out our process, our investigative process, we're constantly communicating with FAA, with Boeing, uh, and other parties to ensure everyone is aware of what we're doing. We're often all doing it together because we uh, collect the factual information together, uh, and that enables FAA and others to make long-term safety change. Thank you.